Hello and welcome. You are watching QTV and you are watching The Week in Review. I'm Ari Darami and here to go through some stories with me is my friend and colleague, Mr. Mboj. Mr. Mboj, as ever, welcome to the program. Thank you. I'm pleased to be here. And uh, I, this is my duty at the beginning of the show because I sometimes assume not everybody watches every week. What it is, we go through 10 big stories from the week and we go through them in some detail. So we've got the National Assembly debating the presence of economic soldiers on uh, Gambian soil. We've got the Ministry of Education admitting that they were wrong, uh, or, or at least that they delayed paying teachers. Uh, we've also got uh, about the TRRC, what happens next, who monitors what happens. Anyway, you'll get the gist as we go through uh, the programme. So uh, to kick off, um, recent incident uh, where separatists in Casamance um, arrested and detained some Senegalese soldiers. That led the uh, National Assembly to debate the matter of their very presence on Gambian soil, and it got quite heated. Have a look. I think today I am vindicated. I remember a question was asked to the former, by, to the former vice president as to why, this was in 2019, still the Senegalese forces are existing in Guyam. What was the response? It took him about 30 minutes to justify why they are still in Guyam. 2016 to 2019, how many years? Almost three years. No change happened. So you cannot tell us today that you have concern about our welfare and our security situation. We are comfortable. We will take the course. We will fight it. And at the end of the day, we will win and we'll be vindicated. Thank you, Honorable. I do appreciate uh, that now the member has really appreciated how uh, the efforts we, we put in in addressing the said matter. And equally, that I do also equally appreciate that the member now feels how we felt uh, 2017 uh, today regarding the presence of the, these uh, said forces in, in, in Fouye. Uh, for the viewers there, I spared you the most heated part of it because a lot of insulting language was used uh, during that debate. But Mr. Mboj, um, for the viewers who might not be okay with Gambian politics, why is the presence of Senegalese soldiers, particularly in Buya, such a contentious matter? Absolutely, and <laughs> actually the way he says as well, because <laughs> technically it's the economic forces. I, indeed. They didn't come as Senegal, that's they right. came as economic. As economic. So, so technically um, that, that's wrong. <coughs> but this is it, the Casamas uh, affair. Mm. And, and the, the, the Fonyi area, you can see certainly the Fonyi National Assembly members who are really that's right. you know, showing all the heat. In, 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 that's in, right, in, about, in, this in particular. about this particular case. And this is it. I don't think that we've ever been this embroiled mm. in the matter. Sure really until now mm -mm. and they will <laughs> face the heat so so what do you do this is really a very very difficult um, situation so then they want uh, sort of Gambia government at, at least to, to show uh, some kind of discretion here mm -hmm. how do we negotiate with economic giving yes. the, the the sensitivities uh, between yeah, our yes. two countries uh -huh. so that they can remove the yes. Senegalese, you can have the uh, Ghanaians, you can uh, have the uh, Nigerians. Uh, that's the point I was going to come to. Yes, exactly. they don't mind their the 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 <laughs> Ghanaian. Uh, uh, mm. uh, apparently also Malian uh, troops, mm -hmm. are, even though they have their own problems going on. I wonder you if know, they're still here. <laughs> but, but, so they don't mind mm. if it's any of the others. So it's anybody but the Senegalese in that specific region. Sure. Absolutely. That, that's what it's about. That yeah. is really the case. But would Senegal want that? Yeah, well. See, this is really the, the elephant in the living room, yes. giving the size, giving the power. Yes. And it's they'll see us, these folks trying to dictate to them, um, as to because ECOMIC says we will deploy. But uh, on the other hand, shouldn't ECOMIC take uh, cognizance of the specific uh, you know, relationship and, and, and sensitivities around it and say, okay, we, we, we appreciate that perhaps Senegalese uh, patrolling that specific area, because they're meant to be all over the country, not just in that sort of border region with Casamans. Uh, perhaps in that reason, we won't, we, region rather, we won't have uh, Senegalese. Shouldn't they take that? that? Yeah. Some people might say, of I course they should, they should have done. But again, this is it, the, the, um, the, the factor of Senegal, the big power within in there. So you get a sense <laughs> that, because again, this debate came up, uh, a sense that Senegal would insist that, no, we actually, we want our soldiers in that specific uh, in that area, specific don't dictate area, to us. That's exactly it. Yeah. 
Yeah. It is favorable. The way they will look at it, it's favorable for their soldiers to be there. Sure. So this is going to be the, 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 the power game. I mean, everybody's sure. like, let's involve ECOWAS, let's do this. You've heard the, 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 the debates, Ali Fasala said mm -hmm. one thing. Indeed. And then the chair of the committee, the Select Committee on Defense, sure. also said they had also called the sure. um, security chiefs mm -hmm. to give them an explanation and then take a report. So this one is a, it's a sticky one. I wonder how, how yeah. Bado would, would handle this one. It is a sticky one. And again, if we go back to this thing of Senegalese, not ECOMIC, mm -hmm. uh, I mentioned in the office that I, I belong to a WhatsApp group, which is mainly peopled by uh, members of the Gambia Armed Forces and some journalists, myself included. And the debate started when one of them said, well, why are you referring to them as ECOMIC soldiers, not Senegalese? And so I then posted, should they not be described as uh, a Senegalese contingent serving with ECOMIC? And then one of the journalists who went when they were released said, well, actually, here's a picture I took of them in captivity, and it says quite clearly ECOMIC. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so there's this whole thing, uh, but uh, as you said, um, we'll probably throw it back to His Excellency the President for a decision as to say, well, yes, maybe if this is becoming um, oversensitive. And you can understand why those National Assembly members were, being, uh, were upset, because many of their constituents were displaced uh, as a result of the, the fighting that spilled over uh, in the most recent um, uh, incident. Oh, oh, absolutely. And I've even heard um, other um, um, journalists say something like, well, you have to bring in the ethnic mm -mm. element, sure. mainly Jolas, Jola. the Casamas um, separatist Jolas, yeah. so they have that um, mm -mm. sympathy, sure. you have to say, because mm -mm. I have to be honest here, when I listened to um, Musa Amul Nyasi, mm -mm. he sounded so partisan, mm -hmm. we yeah. will win. That, that's right. I, I'm yes. not sure if, yeah. if really that is what we want, we want to negotiate here, we don't want any um, partisan passions, sure. you know, as it were, yes. flaring up. So that element also must be factored in, as, as it were, sure. it is part of it. Yeah. It's, uh, as we say, a very serious matter and one that I suspect will be visiting again and again. Uh, well, thank you for that, Mr. Ambroj. And uh, now on to our second story. Um, recently, uh, there was a sit-down strike by teachers and um, it's been resolved. But I pause because I say resolved for the moment. Uh, nonetheless, the Ministry of Basic and Secondary Education called a press conference to brief everybody as to what exactly had happened. Here's a snippet from that. Have a look. The data we got, we processed it, and teachers were paid by the December salary payment. However, there were some data that were still remaining because of the adjustment that some head teachers or administrators decided to do in helping their students. So that data came late, and when it came, it was subjected to verification, as we did in the past, for them to be paid. The reason for verification is to ensure that people who thought between this period or on Saturdays are paid appropriately. Uh, gentlemen there from the from MOPSI, Ministry of Basic and Secondary Education, uh, Mr. Mboj, um, we got some sort of explanation, but you and I have visited this on a couple of shows on uh, this morning and on <laughs> drive time. Mm -hmm. uh, essentially, uh, some teachers were paid, some were not paid. And the thing and I'd, I'd like us to revisit was that really the question was being asked if some have been paid, in fact, if the majority had been paid, why did that then need everybody to go on strike? I mean, what is there an answer to that? Absolutely, <laughs> maybe. And, and I think I got that from the, <coughs> was it the program officer of Gambia um, um, Teachers Union, Mr. Yes. Mandy. I think they were fearful that um, should they just continue going to work without mm. going on strike, mm. then the payments wouldn't have been completed. Sure, sure. So he was trying to give examples in the past where such a thing had happened. Yes, so yes. they realized that fine, even though he, he admitted that <coughs> um, some 90% of the teachers mm. have been paid, but for the sake of the remaining 10, yes. they would go on strike. Otherwise, government would keep on delaying, dragging yes, it, and yes. dragging it, perhaps in the end, I don't know, maybe not. Pay. I think that was it. It was a it, 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 sort of it, tactical. It, it, it of really did maybe. seem to be that. Uh, yes. As we said there, or as we heard there in, in the clip that was just shown, um, they talked about, Mopsi talked about verification needed to be done. Um, because, and one of the more revealing bits that we didn't show in this in, in a clip here was that uh, they actually had teachers submitting 
um, sort of request for payment as part of this COVID fund who had not taught and that they, they even said that they had found some who had submitted and, and were, had submitted incorrectly. They weren't entitled and yet they had submitted. Uh, surely they should have communicated that, that what we're going through is a verification exercise. You told us, you told the press, you told the world, but well, you didn't tell the teachers' union, seemingly. Surely they need to improve their communication between the two. Um, 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 There's um, a lack of trust, isn't there? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So that's it. You, you just do not understand why, mm. you know, there wasn't that trust. Mm. Because I pushed this point, I think, with the, um, the trade unionists. Yes, like the, they were, um, yeah. yes. Yeah. I, I said to him, hey, hey, look, it seems as if there's a process in place. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, 90% wouldn't have been paid. <laughs> you know what I mean? So w w what is going on here? Why the lack of trust? But, 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 but sure. this is it. There's, there's, there's no trust between yeah. the union, the teachers, and the government, the sure. ministry. The well. ministry. And the ministry mm -hmm. used the opportunity to actually um, update everybody on exactly who was entitled. And they said they're the ones who had worked on Saturdays uh, in order that their pupils would actually get uh, these extra lessons. And I guess the reason that we have this delay is because obviously there wasn't a proper system to verify who had and hadn't worked on Saturday, which is of course is why some were able to put in claims when they weren't entitled. Yeah, that, I that guess this is a learning. That's that precisely it. And I put that point, that, that point to him, mm. that the monitoring Mm. should have begun from day one sure. <laughs> you know who is part of the scheme mm. where you know the verification all will go together so that immediately afterwards you will get your numbers then you, you pay them well sure. but it seems not mm. he was trying to give all sorts of reasons why they couldn't get it at the same time oh. and, and that sort of thing but we knew that there were, there were lapses sure. in, the, in the oversight mechanism as it were that is why this thing has emerged sure. but 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 this is it, isn't it a familiar pattern throughout it's our institutions? Well, this is it. So maybe with this experience, they will learn how to tweak it to make it better, I think, changing I the think, system I think with yes. experience after experience. Yeah. I think that's, that's the journey we're going to go on for institutional reform, indeed, it seems. Indeed, it has to happen. <laughs> Thank you for that, Mr. Mboy, because, you know, COVID took us all by surprise and we had to do things differently. Absolutely. So we hadn't had a situation like this before. That's it. Well, yeah. but, but this is the key, though. Mm -mm. We are beginning to see that if, if you give the person too much discretion, mm. if we abandon process mm -mm. because mm. of speed, sure. then you probably encourage corruption. We've been yes. told time and time again so. that the enabling conditions mm. is too much discretion That's to right. the individual. Sure. There must be process and you must follow it. We see how people have been flouting <laughs> the GPPA compliance and exactly. all of these things. There must be process, they must follow it. Sure. That's it. I think it's a great point to end on. Process, follow it. <laughs> End of story. <laughs> Thank you for that. And now on to the TRRC. Uh, TRRC ended. It's, uh, the, the report has been submitted and everybody's sitting back and thinking, mm, what next? How do we monitor? How do we keep them honest about um, seeing that the recommendations are implemented? Well, some people have come up with a suggestion. What's the suggestion? Have a look. We must remember that at the center of justice and reconciliation is ensuring that those who bear the greatest responsibilities for those atrocious crimes committed are held <coughs> accountable. The government said it is reviewing the TRC report and is expected in six months from the day it received the report to issue a white paper on the recommendations of the commission, which includes the prosecution of perpetrators, including former President Yaya Jame. Deputizing for the Justice Minister, the Solicitor General Hussein Tomasi said the establishment of the National Human Rights Commission is to promote and defend the human rights of all. Human Rights Commission um, to defend human rights for all. Sternburg, they've thrown down the gauntlet or thrown the hot potato <laughs> to them. Um, and in a sense, um, this is also a prod for the government because as, as our colleague Ali Yusise said there, the government has six months from the date uh, of the handing over of the report to come up with a white paper which uh, sort of um, specifies how they are going to respond um, to the recommendations. And I suspect some will get kicked into the long grass, some they'll say we can go on. But if the uh, National Human Rights Commission has been tasked with monitoring this. This puts extra pressure on government to make sure that the majority, particularly the ones that people are most concerned about, 
get done and get uh, delivered. Absolutely, and you have a particular eye focused on you. Mm, yeah, <laughs> right. You know, sort of paying attention to, to, to what you're doing. And absolutely, and it will take everybody. I think that was why they call that to the call a national consultative forum. That's right. CSOs, everybody, yeah. every yeah. citizen, it takes us all mm. for, for, for this thing to, um, to be implemented. And really, when you look at it, there are three key areas, isn't it? Mm. Now we just tend to focus on the prosecutions, mm, the judicial yeah. element of, of things. Right. But you've got the reforms. You've got the reforms, yes. You've got yes. the reparations. reparations the, yeah. And then you've got the yes. potential prosecutions. Uh, that's right. So that's it. I'm not sure how who's going to focus on the reforms because they're all yeah. focused on uh, the hard uh, stuff. That's right. Area. And the reforms are cool, they're yeah. crucial. That's right. Really, to good governance. We've seen it was the breakdown of good governance that's that right. gave us what what what. what that's I right. <laughs> because if it goes to the uh, National Human Rights Commission, um, they could do it that way, look at that. Or there were so many themes, I don't know, 13, 16, yes, I can't remember yeah. how many themes there were. Um, I'm not sure they have the staff to actually go theme by theme, rather than, you know, as you said, you know, um, there's the prosecutions, there's the reconciliation, there's the reparations. Mm -hmm, um, and they could look at those, you know, are they sort of because where the um, report recommends reparations, what are they doing? Where it, uh, recommends prosecution, what they're doing, etc., etc. So it's going to be quite a task for Abs them. Absolutely, and they must work with civil society. Of course. Of so course. we will have to help them in all these various areas and as they are uh, yes. monitoring and watching what's going on. That's right, and they seem to be appealing, uh, including yeah. to the media, yeah. to say you, you have a part to play, as does the public. Um, it's not just, oh, it's gone to the Human Rights Commission, let them take it on. Mm -hmm. Everybody has it, because these things affect the whole country. And oh, so, oh. No, absolutely. And even internationally, it goes internationally as well. <laughs> because when you look at the multi-annual um, indicative program that we've just signed, sure. they've given them a target between it's 2021, isn't it, 2021, 2027, 20, but by 2024, That's right. at least 60 percent of recommendations implemented. That's right. See, so it's, it's not just the, you know, the civil society organizations and our commission in here. Yes. Internationally as well, everybody is watching. That's and right. certain advantages we might have, certain programs or projects that we might have had, you know, if we... Have, um, Could get pulled. <laughs> they will pull. <laughs> so a lot is riding on this. Sure, sure. <laughs> and, and we saw um, in the immediate aftermath of the uh, president's victory in the election, um, ECOWAS, the AU, the EU, all said essentially the same thing. And the Americans, um, we hope he will implement the recommendations of the uh, TRRC. So uh, pressure is coming from all sides. Oh, absolutely. And here the problem will be, we know that he will um, implement some. Mm, yeah. Which ones? Which ones? And yes, That's and, it. And, and the ones that get dropped uh, will be the ones that have the most focus. So people are waiting eagerly for the white paper, but you know, six months and that, you know, the clock is already running. I think we're already two months into that or more, more than that. So uh, there's not much uh, time. But then, of course, we've got um, National Assembly elections uh, to come. And so, you know, the makeup of, of that, uh, uh, you know, depending on the results of the uh, uh, election uh, could actually also determine what happens and what gets into that white paper. Oh, oh absolutely. Imagine if he sweeps mm, mm, yes. <laughs> the whole um, 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 National because Assembly. Sure. Ooh, what would they change? That's him? right. What, what would they do to him? That, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Sure. Uh, I think uh, a lot of people now, well, some of us, when you listen to Salu Tal there, mm. um, we are realistic to what we can expect. That was why he said, those who bear the greatest responsibility. Quite. Yes. See? Yeah. That, that narrows it in many ways. Mm -hmm. So you know that because of, for instance, with the prosecutions, we might have to make a deal, yeah, yeah. you know, with the lesser criminals. Yes. So that they can become witnesses yes. for us to get the big ones. Sure. So you've got to have these deals. These things must come. How are we going to handle it? How indeed. Uh, mm. We wait and see. But that, uh, that's an important factor. Thank you for that, Mr. Ambridge. Now on to our fourth story. Um, people can petition um, if they object to certain things, and these petitions can go before the uh, National Assembly, which has a standing committee on public petitions. Not all petitions get accepted. Some did, and some do. Have a look. As the name indicates, it is important that the public know that such a committee does exist in the National Assembly to enable them to channel their concerns for redress. The committee plays a quasi-judicial function and recently it is considering the petitions submitted by the staff of the GT board against its management. 
It is our belief that decisions of the courts are time-consuming and expensive. Therefore, grievances and complaints on policy deficiencies can be dealt with by the committee. Uh, there you heard, um, member of the standing committee. And uh, Mr. Mboj, what I liked about this is that they came out to explain um, to people um, that certain petitions um, got taken up, I think, three out of the 11 uh, that were submitted. Uh, but I was still trying to find up to <laughs> was coming to this program whether they had given detailed um, reasons for the rejection of um, the petitions that didn't meet the criteria, as I think was the phrase they used. Um, and I know one newspaper had been agitating about something in particular, and it was not taken forward. But, and they seemed to indicate that they hadn't been given proper notice of why it was rejected, other than being told it didn't meet the criteria. <laughs> but that aside, um, a good thing for us to have a, a committee uh, of this sort where people can petition? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's just another conduit through yeah. which we can channel sure. grievances or where something is wrong, we yes. need to rectify and it. And when there's a lack of transparency, we, transparency. we want to pull it out. Uh, well, oh, oh, ab ab absolutely. So, but this is it. That was I, when I spoke to one of the members, Raja Jawara, mm -hmm. I said, hey, maybe you should have had this a long time ago, you know, maybe at the beginning. Sure. So you've received um, 11, 11, but only one approved three. three. So yes. people didn't know because yeah. of admissibility that's reasons. Right. That's, that's, that's right. why. But it doesn't matter now. I, yes. <laughs> you know, we, better we, late than never. We are where we are. Better <laughs> late than never. <laughs> yeah, yes, yeah. absolutely. I sure. mean, the matter must be related to public interest, sure. government activities, about administration. Mm. And absolutely. And in the end, I asked him what were the powers. And yeah, because yes. it matters. Yes. What were the powers that the, these people had? The, um, the committees, the committee. all of them, the select yes. committees, yes. well, they make their recommendations and they will follow up to see that they have, you know, uh, people through. comply, <laughs> as it were. Yes. So, if not, if you have a persistent <laughs> offender, as it were, ultimately they yeah. have a right to take, like, yeah, sack yeah. that one. That, that's right. <laughs> so, that's so, right. so, this is it, let's sack that one. Yes. So, yeah, but I, 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 love, I love this. I bit. think so, I and I think in bit. extreme cases they <laughs> could recommend uh, prosecution, obviously. Absolutely. And, and so they mentioned the GT board, Gambia Tourism Board, um, that there were various concerns raised by their staff and that that was one of the petitions that they had actually taken forward because of its seriousness. Yes, I mean, it's empowering. Yes. We, we want this sort of the legal framework mm. to be there so that we can use it. Sure. Without the legal frame, framework, we can't. Mm. Even though we tend to say that we've got so many laws in there, but nobody implements mm -hmm. them. Okay, fine, granted. But now you, you, you can see this renewed energy yes, you know, from the um, 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 CSOs. So CSOs and, uh, particularly. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So we'll be constantly maybe going to the National Assembly with sure. this, um, the, the Petitions com Committee sure. or going to the courts, as the case might be. We know yeah. that that one is expensive. Sure. <laughs> well, but this, this one is not <laughs> so expensive. Expensive. So it's a fantastic idea. Yeah. So we should take advantage of it sure. and things that we feel that are going wrong we take them to the before the committee great and uh, let's hope people see that and do that thank you for that mr Mboj. Uh now on to our fifth story um the film industry um is huge um uh, not far from our borders you know certainly in africa anyway you have nollywood the nigerian uh, kind of version of hollywood you have bollywood which is the indian one and of course the american one hollywood which gave rise to all these woods. Um, what about in the Gambia? What are we doing to try and get actors properly trained in order that we too can have such an industry? Have a look. I believe that we can go global with our stories. The reason is very simple. Stories, when they work, they're universal. I think the first thing to understand when we're talking about film, when we're talking about TV, that it's an industry. So one of the most critical sides of it is money. People don't want to accept that, but it's the truth. We can't set up a film industry unless it's sustainable. For it to be sustainable, we need to make films and stories that we can sell globally. Now, if the stories that we tell are about the things that all human beings share on this planet, they'll get it. There's some little details that makes us Gambian. Let's not take that out. Let's leave that in. That's the salt and pepper cannibal stuff. You understand? Uh, there you had Babu Sise, who Mr. Mboj, of course, you have interviewed <laughs> on a different, and he was given, and, and, and he said something there, you know, uh, about the universality 
of stories, uh, if they're good, they can appeal, um, which is why the Nigerian one has, has, has kind of uh, grown. Uh, and sh but we've had nothing really of the kind. There'd been one or two films made here in the Gambia by Gambian actors and actresses, but, but, but very few. But now we have somebody of his stature coming to actually launch a, a kind of training yes. academy to kick start in, in a big way. What, Gumwood? Yes, well, well, <laughs> well, 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 <laughs> Gumwood, yeah, indeed. Yeah, whatever. It, that's right. Um, yes, absolutely. I mean, I was just reading something the other day. They said, actually, the, the, film, the film that really popularized those roots, uh, there were no Gumwoods in, in it. <laughs> Quite. it oh, oh, fantastic. Some time back, I remember yes. we had this thing called Vinasha. There right. was Vinasha Productions. Right, yeah. right. They were trying to do films, okay. but the professionalism thing he's going to bring into mm, it, you mm. see, the training, because so everybody else, it was on the job training. That's right. <laughs> I know. mean, you've had the odd <laughs> movie made mm -hmm. here and in mm -hmm. other countries like Mirror Boy, which, which uh, Genevieve Naji, big Nigerian actress, was in, as was um, Fatima Bio, who's now the first lady of Sierra Leone. That was a huge movie, um, mm. but, but it's been quite patchy and they've been just the odd one or two and some of them not very good, uh, one has to be honest. Yeah. Oh, oh yes, oh yes, oh, 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 when it comes to film or acting. Uh, but, but funnily enough though, when it comes to drama, mm, yeah. theatre, mm -hmm. as this thing from film yes, and, and, and yes. television, that sort of thing, well, we've had people who put in some decent efforts sure, in sure. it. So it was more popular at schools, as yes. I was telling you, during independence, yes. a week or so before, or, or months actually before, you were acting out all <laughs> these morality tales <laughs> about um, patriotism and all of the rest course. of it. So that level has been here. Sure. But it's just the amateur. So now to professionalize it, that's right. that that's is right. the problem. Yes. The professional actor being yes. in films and they're profitable and that sort of thing. No, but that's a fantastic it idea. It's there a great and idea. this Abunjan theatre. It's only well, well, acting well that's right. learn and move that's on. Right. Perhaps more would come in. And yeah. before you realize it, we'll get the makings of a gumwood. Yes, <laughs> and yes. who knows? Let's hope so. <laughs> and and uh, say Babu Sise there. And and I think one of the things I particularly like about it is he's he's actually teaching them that there are different types of acting. There are people who um, in the past, in certainly in England and in America, there were great stage or theatre actors. And for many of them, they didn't translate to movies mm -hmm. because they realized all of a sudden, you're not actually projecting to an audience, you're projecting to a camera, <laughs> you know, and it's quite different. Uh, and some of them didn't make the transition. And so what, you know, what Babu is teaching them is that, you know, there is this difference and, and you know, you can, you, you can be both. You don't have to be one or the other. Mm -hmm. You can be both, but he's trying to show them that there are different aspects to it. And if you're going to be on the stage in the theater, this is, how you project and so on, and as you said, wonderful. Yeah, I'm really absolutely. looking forward to it. Uh, absolutely, the nuances, yes, the quite. subtleties, yes, absolutely yes. fantastic there. And, and, and the, the one I like is about what they call method acting, yeah, yes, and indeed. there was the other one. Yeah. So I once heard Sir, Sir John Gilgood, for some, for instance, when you're acting, sort of getting tired and all of that, they go for a run, all right, and right. they come back and they you know, just act it. So Sir so, 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 so John Gilgood said, where is the acting? Uh, yeah, if quite, you if you run. have to go for a run. <laughs> Absolutely so right. Very interesting. Isn't Absolutely it? Right. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's a brilliant that's idea. Right, because yeah. we know that stories, we are our stories, the stories we tell ourselves. Yes, so that is why it matters to me so much that we have our own soap operas. Indeed. You know what I mean? Sure. From when we are kids, this, whatever you are told, whatever narrative is around, mm -hmm. that's what you take to construct yourself. Indeed. So I tell people when we were younger, we used to watch teenagers, um, the Cosby Show. Okay, <coughs> yeah, sure. So some of us sort of used to, used to model ourselves on Theo. Right, Th right. That's sort of, this is what you do. You use the resources, what is around you, sure. because you're trying to form a self. Sure. So you use the stories around you to construct, to form your own identity, your own um, um, character. Sure. So the stories we tell, sure. ultimately, if we're going to change the new African that we've been searching for in independence, is in the stories. Indeed, it's in the stories. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for that, Mr. Mboj. <laughs> and I'd just like to give a <laughs> shout out to a deceased grand aunt, Auntie Vivian, who used to um, every uh, night if we had finished our homework, she would sit us on the ground and she would tell us a different story every single day. Absolutely brilliant. The stories were gripping and she was a great storyteller. That's what we need. Thank you for that. And that takes us nicely onto a break. And after the break, we will have five more great stories. Don't go away. Join us after this commercial break. <laughs> With so many things to do in a single day, 
it's important to have a network you can trust. When there's family and friends to connect with and business calls to make, you need a network that is reliable and fast. Talk longer, browse faster, go farther and roam wider. When your network is solid, the world is your oyster. QCell, your trusted network in the Gambia. Looking for the fastest and easiest way to receive money transfers from abroad? Well, QMoney and RIA just made it happen. Now you can receive international money transfer from RIA directly into your QMoney account with no additional cost. Once you receive an SMS alert about your transfer, walk into any QMoney agent across the country to receive your payment for free or use the money immediately to buy credit, QPower and other QMoney services. It's fast, safe and convenient. For more info, call Customer Care on 133. QMoney, Sunyu Kalpe. Terms and conditions apply. Uh, welcome back. And if you just joined us, you are watching QTV and you are watching the Week in Review. I'm Ade Darami, and here in the studio with me is Mr. Momorun Boj. And we've been going through some of the stories. We've done five so far. You know what I'm going to say next? Five great stories still to go. Um, now, uh, the next one, uh, if you live uh, in the Gambia, um, one of the things that you hear people complain about, electricity and water. On QTV News, we regularly feature people who say, you know, we don't have drinking water or, you know, borehole has been, you know, it's, it's filthy or we're digging wells and we're getting water from a well. But Nawek, they're responsible for both the water and the electricity. Recently, they took people on a tour to show them why they're having some of the problems they're having. Have a look. Our understanding is that for copper or whatever material they are looking for, we have done everything possible. You will see that the cable is buried. You cannot see it physically outside. This particular person has to go and break the lock and enter inside just to cut a piece of three meter and a half, and take it away and stop the whole operation just for the interest of just making that piece of copper, which I don't think if you weigh it, it will even go over a kilo. Um, so looking at the value of money you get from that and the amount of destruction cannot be equate. It's really, really a big loss for all of us and then really making our customers suffering for nothing. Making customers suffering for nothing, Mr. Mboj, we all know this story. If you live in Gambia, you know, when I used to come here as a tourist, these things were kind of, were lost on me. Uh, I, I wasn't aware of them, but having lived here for close to three years now, I realize uh, the suffering of some people. And uh, there we had um, some of what has happened, you know, people breaking in and damaging and stealing stuff. And then it affects whole neighborhoods, whole communities, whole towns in some instances. Terrible stuff. That's it. And in these um, vandalisms, mm. we used to associate them with sort of like kids, juveniles, yeah, uh, you know, teenage kicks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's yeah, that's yeah. sort of thing. But here it seems that this couldn't happen. <laughs> you know, no. Possibly a, a grown Somebody up, determined and determined a grown-up grown uh, um, wanted um, to steal something, things. to sell it. Un un unbelievable. Um, what do you do? Mm. To, to, to stop this sort of vandalism. There's no point just appealing to people's morality. That's Which never going to happen. For some works. people, that's a, their own selfish interest would trump any kind yeah. of um, 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 thinking. The idea that we must bring in more of the people mm, yeah, sure, sure. without that policing, community and policing that was kind of, of these things, there was an appeal to that. Yes. And this is the key. But, but how do you do it? Can you help? the people to organize themselves, yeah. you know, so that we have this um, 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 this recognition yes. that we have to police the public goods. <laughs> this is it, because yes. if, if, yeah. if it's cut, as happened there, mm, mm. we're the ones who are going to suffer. Yes. So we have a uh, self-interest yes. in making yeah. sure it doesn't happen. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so this is really the key. How do you bring in more? And even wider, create recreation, because you oh. know that with the youth bulge, yeah. you will be having these things. Some of it are serious, this, this. Yeah. Maybe others not so serious. Mm -hmm. It might involve adults and kids. And then they tell you that, at least for teenage um, 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 vandalism, what, sure. what they do is about the 
boredom. Well, you know what? <laughs> a, a, a colleague of ours, as this was playing during the news um, uh, on, on QTV, mm -hmm. he was very dismissive. He said, come on, if this site was so important to Nawik, why didn't they have it properly guarded? <laughs> Uh, which I, I thought was a bit harsh, um, you know, because it was one particular site. But the guy even went so far as to say, you know, this the cables are even underground. So, I mean, it takes a really determined individual to kind of dig and dig and dig and dig till you get to the stuff and then cut it. And then every borehole? Because that's do, really do what you, you're talking about. What you're about. saying, look, yes. nationwide, nationwide, you can't guard them all. You, you, can't, you can't do that. So the community, we must take responsibility sure. and come into it. There's really yeah. no two way about yeah. it because when it happens, we will suffer. So it's about that dependency culture we talk oh. about yeah. all the time. Yeah, I just want to sit at home, and you know, Nauik, comfortable, and um, relax. Yeah. So everything's about now. It's always somebody else's responsibility. Yeah. It's very strange. Yeah, it I never comes back to us. At all. It's always outside. Yeah. It, it, it cannot work. That is why we, we are told that really for democracy to work mm. you need the politicians the good ones who would stimulate it but truly it takes it's everybody different. for democracy to work That's right. so the people we must also grow up to a certain level and take certain initiatives certain That's responsibilities this is it. And, and particularly in an instance like this when we're the ones who suffer we are the ones who, who <laughs> will suffer you think we'd give a damn but <laughs> <laughs> apparently we don't <laughs> but thank you for that mr Mbodge. and now on to sport uh, one of two sports stories that we've got on this uh, segment. Uh, this time it is about the women's. Uh, we've just had the AFCON. Well, the uh, version for women will take place later this year in Morocco. And Gambia had hopes of pulling off a major upset. I won't spoil it for you, but first have a look at this. We are just here to deliver something. And that is expected from the whole Gambia, the whole world. We are not going to play with a small thing or a small country. So we all knew how Cameroon and what Cameroon can do when it comes to women's football. But like I want to send this message to the entire Gambians that we will do our best and we will surely make them proud. Cameroon are favourites having more experienced players playing for top clubs and some with World Cup experience. Can the Gambia women's team cause an upset? Uh, can they cause an upset? If you're watching this, you already know the answer to that. The answer is no, they cannot, um, unless it is the upset of the ages. Um, <laughs> because in that, uh, at Amadou Ahijo Stadium, uh, Mr. Mboj, on Friday, um, on um, Independence Day, these Cameroonians, they're heartless people. Um, they beat us 8-0. Uh, but I, I had a discussion about this with Geneva Sonko on QTV's This Morning program during the week. And she was hopeful that we could pull off an upset. And I said, yes, there can be upsets in football. But the disparity, because women's football is not that advanced in the Gambia. It is quite advanced in Cameroon. But more than that, several of their players are professionals playing for some of the top world club for um, uh, uh, cl you know clubs in in world football mm -hmm. um, and and so it was always a kind of an unfair because we got back past Sierra Leone we Gambia to get to to this stage but this was really a bridge too far and eight nil the first goal was after two minutes and it was four nil by half time to gain a fix my flyer that sort of thing sure um God we we focused on the men, the team, Scorpions, sure. for a very long time, not mm. much on the women. Mm, 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 this mm, is mm. our first time we managed to go to AFCON. What does that <laughs> that, yeah. that tells you. And, and, and what does that tell you? That, that's right. <laughs> We've not been spending much on women. At all. It at will all. take time sure. for them as well to build up mm -hmm. and then hopefully sooner or later we'll be celebrating for the women. Would it be the first AFCON for the women? Yes, yes. It's, it's the first. It first. will be the first AFCON yeah, for, yeah. for the women. Yeah. Just those, the, the men. We, we broke the ceiling. Yeah, that's right. That's the, way the glass ceiling that went okay. through. Their turn will come. Their turn this will come. all adds up. The Their gaining experience. So and it was obvious that the Cameroonian side was just far too powerful. Well, well indeed. And, and, and this is a lesson for us because GFF, um, I remember them being criticized when football returned after COVID. Um, they still were not able to give a date to the women's game in the Gambia as to when they would restart. And it took, it was quite a while after the men's game had been long you know 
re, uh, instated that, that eventually the Women's League was kick-started. So this is a really a wake-up call for them and, and for us that should we still have a long way to go. Should be prioritised. Now what we are seeing around the world, they should be equal. Yes, indeed, indeed. On uh, equal footing. The, that's right. You know, those ideas are gone now. They must be on equal footing yeah. in many ways. Yes, so yes. equal consideration as a way of, of interest so that we'll mm. have them come up green. Thanks. And we wish them well in the um, return leg and we hope at least um, they, they play for pride and, you know, give it a real go. But uh, thank you for that, Mr. Ambroge. And uh, now on to a completely different subject. Um, when I came to the Gambia, I was quite surprised that uh, people had to renew their driver's license annually. Um, I got mine about 35 years ago in the UK and I never had to renew it. It's just there. <laughs> but here in the Gambia, it's annual. And there's been a debate for a while now as to why this need for an annual renewal. Here's what some people thought. Driver's license give legal authorization for a specific individual to operate one or more types of motorized vehicles. In the Gambia, vehicle owners renew their licenses yearly as opposed to most countries where drivers renew every five or ten years or are subjected to no form of renewal. In the United Kingdom, there is no need for renewal once one has a license. Every end of year, drivers are expected to pay $850 or face a penalty. There is an ongoing debate as to whether this should continue. Let's continue that debate. <laughs> should it continue, Mr. Mboj? Um, one of the clips uh, which we didn't show in that specific one, the person who, who um, we interviewed actually thought that um, it was because drivers were tested every year and then, um, and then they had to be told, actually, no, they're not tested. So what's the <laughs> logic behind having it renewed, having to renew it annually when, as we've said there, across the rest of the world, that's a very rare thing? Well, what do you do with a cheap product? Yeah. Every year you have to change it. Yeah, <laughs> what does it take to, it to get this? I mean, it's just a matter of extracting from people. Yes, I mean, and again, in that, <laughs> there are some people we couldn't even show because essentially they were admitting to committing a crime that they'd paid and got their license without going through any test, never mind being tested annually. Mm. Um, and of course, when they want to renew it, they just go and renew the one that they got illegally. So, uh, you know, uh, so is it a matter of revenue generation? Is that why? I mean, cause that's what the cynics have said. And it would be nice to hear from, uh, you know, the, the, the authorities as to why they think that there needs to be an annual renewal. It's That's got to be extortionate. What difference has it, has it made? Yeah. They're renewing all the time. Look at the accident rate. It's look at the going you know, up and up. Look at uh, going up and up. Mm. What difference has it made at all? Yeah. They're merely trying to extort from, from people. Is the state extorting from ordinary people? Yeah, Renewing your license every year. I mean, come on, it's, it's, it's a crazy idea. It's, it's bad it's, idea. It's, it's honestly. It's, it's not it's making any difference at all. When it's I not first improving anything. Yeah. It's <laughs> 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 any difference except for them making money for them. Actually, we should ask them, where does this money go? <laughs> Good question. And they'll tell you it goes on upkeep of the equipment oh to make God. sure that it's done annually. But it's, 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 it's a bonkers one. And, uh, you know, uh, as we've said here, we hope that, uh, you know, th they'll, they'll let us know at some stage where this money goes. But at the moment, it's, this debate will go on and on, you know, and eventually they'll have to scrap it. Uh, thank Maybe you for that. something we need to take to the petitions committee. Uh, uh, <laughs> a very good one. Let me make a note about <laughs> that. <laughs> thank you for that, Mr. Ambuj. We've got two more stories to go. And the next one, uh, the Immigration Department now do um, annual briefings um, to tell us about their workings and about the challenges that they faced uh, throughout the year just gone. Uh, they held one recently, and here's some of what they said. The number here is 657 people who have you know offered to come on their own and uh, we are glad to report that the GID was able to successfully coordinate and facilitate the safe arrival and integration of these people into the greater Gambian society. The migration management unit on behalf of the GID was also able to successfully provide reception meaning reception services for 189 deported Gambians, mainly from European Union territories. Um, we were also able to intercept you know, um, 162 people, 162 would-be migrants, you know, who were trying to um, embark on a perilous journey. Um, 
trying to push back the waves, um, stopping uh, migrants who are trying to go on the sort of illegal, uh, dangerous journeys. Um, but also interesting there for them to update the public that, you know, it's not always just IOM that sort of receives back our deported uh, citizens. We, as in the immigration department, also have a role to play in that, in getting them back and sort of trying to reintegrate them. Um, but generally, what did you get from that, the, the report and, and sort of these challenges that the immigration department has to face? Um, well, <laughs> yeah, they are all coming with this. Um, press briefings, yeah, sort of yeah. to have a uh, maintain a good PR, have a positive yeah. um, 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 PR public relations with people. Um, um, absolutely, they've done wonderful things. <laughs> they will yeah. tell us that they've done wonderful things. They've been catching this, they've been catching that, yeah. and all the rest of it. But again, you, you wonder. Um, no sooner <laughs> do they tell you what they've, they've achieved, they start to uh, parade. They start to list all the challenges <laughs> they're facing. Which and they all did. Uh, Which they did. Yeah, of course, of course they did. O o all the challenges and stuff. And then you 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 you, you wonder your so-called achievements you're, you're giving me that if you're facing all these challenges mm. so how does that your, your, your so-called achievements how do they how did you achieve them how did you get them in the face of in, in the face of all, all these of challenges. these uh, challenges so and then when I look at the bigger picture can I really see the bigger picture I can only imagine it how much of a, an effect mm. Are you having any broader issues? It's sure. really difficult for me to judge yes. anything. I don't have a baseline. Mm -mm. <laughs> no. I, I mean There's I, no baseline. Yes. I just have to take w w what you say. You sure. know, on the one hand, you will tell me all these problems you sure. have. And on the other hand, you want to present another picture of all these wonderful achievements you've got. <laughs> I'm I finding it difficult. I don't have a baseline. Sure. I really cannot judge yeah. some of these things. It is a problem I have. Yes, I mean, <laughs> so it's a difficult one. And I remember our colleague, Choi, maybe 18 months ago or so, did a story around immigration and about how easy it was. And I, I, I said, you know, I have a, a certain amount of sympathy for the immigration department because of the odd geography of the Gambia. Um, it's, it's an impossibility to have border posts <laughs> around the length of Gambia. And so you had people who went back and forth between Gambia and Senegal at places where there was no border post. They, they didn't feel, you know, they'd made an arrangement with somebody in Senegal to pick them up at a certain point and they crossed during the time of COVID um, because they didn't want to go through, because the country is just so weirdly shaped because of, you know, geography and colonial decisions that it's an impossibility. And those are some of the challenges they face. So when they nab a few, of course, they want to crow about it, I guess. That's <laughs> it. So yeah. let's go for the commonsensical one, no borders. Gambia yeah. and Senegal, open, freedom well, well, of movement. Well, this is it. Uh, you know, <laughs> when you uh, really think about it, mm. just open it up, freedom of yes, movement. Well, what difference would it make? I mean, given the peculiarities, just like you've just said, the peculiarities of, of geography. Of the geography, yes. Why this not? is it. And, Otherwise, and you, you really can't. Uh, yeah. And our, our reporters can stop talking about porous borders. <laughs> <laughs> because really and truly, that is, that is the situation we find ourselves in. Um, we have these borders, um, you know, around us. And, and there's sort of a, a, you know, a nonsense, really, um, you know, given the, the kind of weird shape of the country, the weird shape of the kind of, you know, the geographical fact, that it's, it's almost impossible to stop people, you know, going back and forth, and, and some of them are probably involved in criminal activity, you know, bringing in drugs, taking out drugs, as the case may be. And, you know, um, yes, as I said, I have some sympathy for the uh, immigration department because it's, it's a really uh, thankless task that they have. Completely. If I'm determined uh, yeah, to uh, go to Senegal, uh, 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 oh, well, I will. I mean, I know people <laughs> who did yes. um, at a time when the borders were closed, theoretically. Um, and they went. Um, they went and, uh, and they came back and no, nobody picked them up, nobody stopped them. Um, so it, it, it is a, a bit of a difficulty, but I mean, uh, you know, I, I said, you know, when I watched it, um, I said, you know, because I'm aware of some of the challenges they have, I, 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 I welcome them, you know, coming out and giving these briefings. As you said, part of it is in, in the areas of transparency, because I think they're aware that uh, some of the public aren't aware of all the work they do. They think they just issue these cards, ID cards and so on. But um, they wanted to make the point that actually there's a lot more to our job and these are some of the other things we do and this is how well. They weren't, yes, they bragged about, you know, where they, they 
did well, but they also were honest enough to say that there are many things that we weren't able to do because well, we can't be everywhere all the time. Absolutely, yes, yeah. and, and, and one understands that. So mm. therefore, what do you do? You, you break it down to what is it that I can achieve? Sure. Perhaps sure. it would have been interesting to say that, hey, look, we've got challenges A, B, C, and D, mm. but we'll give you these benchmarks. Sure. Within a year or two years, we expect to see this. You know, just, just yes, that would take be it to bite-sized chunks, sure. mm -hmm. <laughs> as, as it were. Sure. Then we can move on. We know what, 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 what we face. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is just that we don't want incompetent sure. people running exactly. our institution, incompetent or corrupt. Sure. But one understands the enormousness of the, of the problem. Sure. So you will have sympathy if one people can see competence and honesty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what you do. Because sure. sometimes you can be honest, you wouldn't get the outcomes you want. Life yes, doesn't yes. work like that. But sure. still people appreciate, people sure. laud you for yeah. your honesty sure. and, and that like and that your competence for me the competence comes back into it you know having policies um implementing them turning them into action and then getting reasonably the right outcomes i can never get 100 percent yes but at the 60 70 percent of my <laughs> of my plans that's how it works that's how it works and at least people know you've tried <laughs> you know yeah, absolutely thank you, yeah. thank you. Uh, thanks for that mr <laughs> that takes us on to our final story um i'm a big sports fan, Mr. Mboj likes different sports as well. Um, I did athletics, but there are huge, huge challenges for those trying to do athletics in this country. So pay attention to this report, but also pay attention to the cutaways of people running and you'll see the conditions under which they are running. Have a look. One of the biggest challenges that we face is the, the lack of resources, that is the funds. The required funds to organize this competition. Sometimes before we even pack up to reach out to a particular zone or region, uh, we have to struggle. If, we, um, if at all the, uh, the Gambia Teachers Union, Cooperative Credit Union is not available, uh, most of the time we will not be able to um, um, organize these events. Ask about the finals of the Inter-Schools Athletics Championship to be held at the Independent Stadium which is currently closed for renovation, Ismail Asisi responded that the final will go ahead in March. Uh, there you saw towards the end of that report by our colleague Gajaga, um, the conditions I'm talking about, dirt track. So Mboj, the likes of Usain Bolt, they are us. Mm -hmm. They are descended from West Africans. Mm -hmm. Him and all the Jamaicans who are winning all these medals. Uh, so we're not so different. But what is different, and I mentioned this to Gajaga, I said, please go on YouTube and have a look at the Jamaican Schools Championship and you'll see the conditions under which they run. They are world class. Now, you're not going to get world class athletes if you're running on dirt tracks. Why are we not? I know there are competing mm -hmm. <laughs> things mm -hmm. for funds, mm -hmm. but uh, these people end up bringing in money whether they're footballers who earn a lot or sportsmen and women who earn a lot uh, because they benefited from facilities and infrastructure. Why yeah. have we not done the same in, in putting um, you know, funds into infrastructure? Yes, um, um, absolutely. Um, they're descendants f from us, but, but as we, we are told in, in some <laughs> evolutionary theory, just cross a river, <laughs> then you become and something you else. else. <laughs> or as we say in Sierra Leone, you jump into the water and you become a fish. Absolutely. <laughs> so, so the mindset, everything yeah. different. But when you look at our society, Sadi, really, even in serious areas, we've not been spending. Mm -mm. And you know that we are not going to prioritize sports. Right. So you can imagine how much we're going to put into sports. Mm, mm, mm. So there's a basic seriousness that, that must change. Yes. Even in health and education, we complain of all the time that we don't spend. Mm, mm. Then sports will be way, 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 way behind. I, and you know, <laughs> I, I was, there's a center for strategic whatever, uh, an American CSIS. And they asked me this in their podcast. They said, well, you know, you, you're saying that there's lack of, uh, you know, support and infrastructure. If you were to reach out to the American or the British um, government, what would you ask for? And I said I would ask for them to send coaches here to coach, you know, international level coaches, world class coaches, um, for them to come and give us build infrastructure rather than give money to the government for all sorts of other things. Because, as I say, there's a kind of short-sightedness that people don't see that if we produce world-class athletes, they don't just win medals, they bring in money as well uh, to countries. And, and you know, I keep saying, look how well Jamaica is doing, look how well Trinidad 
and, and, and Bahamas and Barbados because they have invested in infrastructure. So come, yes, build mini stadia, build a decent running track for our athletes and we can elevate them and send these coaches to come here six months at a year, whatever it is, to come and coach our people to bring them up to that level because we have it, it's there, the talent is, the raw talent is there. Absolutely. When, when, when you said that to your friend, to, to the British or whoever, to send us coaches, yeah, yeah. what is it that Cabral did when, he, <laughs> when the Cubans said to him, should we give you soldiers? He said, said no. no. We have to do our, our fight. fight. Just send me the technical that's, people. That's it's right. The technique and uh, technical people. Exactly. That's what I want. Technology, that sort of thing. That's right. Absolutely. Yes, we yes. said it here time and time again. Sometimes it is not necessarily about money, money. as such, no. but that's it. But government or the institutions um, um, controlling whatever activity, sure. be more facilitative. Mm -hmm. sure. You have these um, relationships with other bodies in the world that are um, 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 good at it, good at whatever they do. Sure. Then you can be bringing them over to help your structure, your um, right. whatever you're trying to do in your own country, to help it grow. Sure. So. Um, well, we do that, I suppose, sometimes, but we should do more of it. Sure. We should do more of it. We should do more of it. In the 60s, uh, there was a project by the West Germany, as they were then, um, where they sent out these uh, football coaches to various countries. And there was a chap called Borkat Papa. Uh, we called him Papé uh, in Sierra Leone. And for the period, 18 months, 20 months, when he was the Sierra Leone coach, that was the most successful period in the country's football history. I was actually quite shocked to find out that he's still alive. He's about 88 now. In fact, I've written to him because um, I'd love to interview him because he's still viewed with great. But when I read his story, I r realized that there were about five or six other coaches from Germany who went out to other African countries, Zambia, Uganda, and so on. And all of those countries, they hold these people in the highest of esteem because of the change it made. So it wasn't always about money. They were completely funded by the German government, but they made such a difference. Absolutely. It's, it, it's the mindset, it's the whole ecology, mm. it's, it's the whole feeling. That is really, that's really it. That's, it. <laughs> that's really it. Yeah. So, you know, we were talking about tracks, actually, once while you were talking, I just recall in Kenya. Mm -hmm. It's the critic in there. When it comes to long distance, you know, the way it is, you, you don't tend to see in the mountains <laughs> any, 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 any tracks as, as such. But again, because they've got this pedigree, sure. maybe good practice That's it right. is there, they know what to, to do. And those with um, um, the ambition sure. become world class athletes, world beating athletes. Time has caught up with us, Mr. So Mboj. <laughs> <laughs> we reached the finish line, <laughs> if I can just use that pun. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mboj, for your interventions throughout. <laughs> and you. as always, I say to our viewers, thank you for watching. And until the next time, it's goodbye from me. Goodbye. <laughs>